All right. Well, aloha mai kako. I hear that we are live. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome you today to Demonica's Observatory's live question and answer session on the recent detection of the molecule of phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus. Now, this is a result that has stoked excitement all around the world. So what is phosphine? What does it really mean? Is there really life on Venus? Why does it matter to us Earthlings here? Uh, over the next hour, you will have your very own chance to ask your own questions in the comment section of this video. So you can start now. There's no question too big or too small, and there's no questioner who is too young or too old. My name is Dr. Steve Mares, but my friends like to call me Spaceman Steve. And I'm the senior scientist at the James Clark Maxwell Telescope right here in beautiful Hilo, Hawaii. So thank you to everybody who is tuning in today. I am absolutely honored and thrilled to tell you that through the power of technology and properly socially distanced, I am joined today by our expert panel of five of the scientists who contributed to this amazing landmark result, which we will be talking about in just a moment. So allow me to introduce them. First, there is Dr. Emily drawbeck Monder. Emily is an astronomer and a science communicator. She is currently the Senior Manager of Public Astronomy at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich in London, England. As an astronomer, she uses telescopes to study the formation of stars and planets in our galaxy, the Milky Way. And Emily became interested in astronomy as a child when she would look up at the night sky and wonder if we were alone in the universe. And she still does today. Welcome, Emily. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, it's our absolute pleasure. Thank you for coming. Next, we have Dr. Clara Souza Silva, AKA Dr. Phosphine. Clara is a quantum astrochemist, which is one of the coolest job titles I've ever heard, and a science communicator at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She investigates how molecules interact with light and whether those molecules can be biosignatures. Her favorite one, of course, is phosphine. When she isn't working on phosphine, Clara enjoys struggling through crosswords. She claims that she's really bad at them, but as a scientist, I need to see evidence of that. Welcome, Clara. Hi, Steve. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and I am really bad at crosswords. It is not a humble brag. <laughs> Makes me feel better because I'm not great at them myself. <laughs> uh, next, we have Dr. Jess Dempsey. Jess is the deputy director of the James Clark Maxwell Telescope, the telescope here in Hawaii that made the original detection that we will be discussing today. She's also my boss. She likes building things, and as an instrument scientist, she has built telescopes in places as far away as the South Pole in Antarctica, where she spent up to a year freezing in the name of science. So welcome, Jess. Hey, Steve. Thank you for having me on. Oh, thank you for being here. And next we have Dr. Sukrit Ranjan. Sukrit is a current postdoctoral fellow at Northwestern University and a, formal, a former postdoctoral fellow at MIT. He is a planetary scientist focused on studying the emergence, endurance, and detection of life on rocky planets. He has a deep-seated love of heights, which he accesses as a biker, a hiker, and a pilot. <laughs> Welcome, Sukrit. Thanks very much, Steve. Great to be here. Great to have you here. And last, but certainly not least, we have Dr. William Baines. William is a research affiliate at MIT. He is a biochemist who has spent the last 25 plus years working on the chemistry of how Earth's life forms and whether this could be different on other worlds. This work is almost all done on computers and scraps of paper. He still has a paper diary, he mentions, but he's also worked in the lab as well. Um, mostly, uh, most recently, he's been building the science of his startup company, Five Alarm Bio. He started working on phosphine as a sign of life on other worlds at MIT in 2015, predicting that the most likely place to find it was a planet almost completely unlike Venus. He occasionally breaks into song, but despite the guitar in the back, and unfortunately for us, not over the internet. Welcome, William. Hi, Steve. Good to be here. Great to have you here. So aloha to everybody who is just joining us right now. Please, if you have not done so already, uh, start submitting your questions via the YouTube comments for our panelists. This is your chance to ask the experts anything that you want to know about Venus and the kind of work that they've been doing. But to get the ball rolling first, let's start off with a little bit of context. So uh, let's go to Dr. Emily Drabeck-Monder. Emily, briefly, 
what is this Venus result that the whole world seems so excited about? Okay, so in our study, we've used telescopes, including the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope in Hawaii, to spot a rare gas in the clouds surrounding Venus. And this gas is called phosphine. Now on Earth, phosphine gas is mainly connected to life. So it's produced by things like human activity, like industry, but it also comes from microorganisms or microbes like bacteria. Now our discovery is really exciting because so far we cannot explain the amount of phosphine gas that we see from our current understanding of the planet Venus. So this means that we have to start thinking outside the box. The phosphine gas that we see could be produced through some sort of unknown chemical or geological activity happening on Venus, or like the Earth, it could be caused by some sort of life that produces the gas, like microorganisms. Well, that's really exciting, I would have to say. Okay, so some unknown exotic chemical processes that haven't been considered yet, and I've read the paper, a lot have been considered, or there is something else like microorganisms, like life that might be generating this. This is fantastic. Let's see, I see I have a couple questions coming in right now. And I would like to give a shout out to third grade at Waikoloa Elementary School, by the way, who is tuning in today. So thank you so much for coming here. Make sure you ask your questions. Um, first of all, we have a question coming in from Rusky Ivanich. Um, and they are asking, what was the process used to detect the phosphine molecule? So I might uh, send that over to Dr. Jess Dempsey, who works at the telescope that made the detection. What was the process used, Jess? Right, so um, this was actually done using a, a receiver called Receiver A, uh, which is uh, actually we've now just retired it from the telescope, it's our oldest instrument. And it's using a, a technique which we can closest to compare to how you maybe tune your radio in your car. So this is not something like a camera where you would take a snapshot and, and then have a look and see what you found. Instead, what you have to do is you have to tune just like a radio very, very carefully to a specific frequency, which the little tiny antenna suddenly becomes sensitive to. And it's a really, really hard thing to do, particularly with something like Venus, which is very, very bright and has lots of com complexity. It's kind of like tuning the radio in your car to a very faint station while going at 100 miles per hour down the highway with the top off and 100,000 louder radio stations around you. But once you get all that done and you start to tune in, the, the great thing is just like that radio station, you know exactly what you must be looking at because there's only one thing at that frequency, that molecule, which is going to be emitting there. And that's the power of these sorts of instruments and why it's worth doing. And the only other cool thing is, unlike your phone or your camera might have... 12 million pixels in it, maybe, uh, we had one pixel, just a single tiny pixel. And that was enough to be able to get this amazing detection. Never doubt the power of a single pixel. That's incredible, right, in this day and age. <laughs> That's amazing. And unlike your phone as well, the instrument is actually quite large, too. It, uh, it certainly doesn't fit in your pocket, the camera that we're using. <laughs> Thanks so much for that, Jess. Uh, yeah, well, we have lots of questions coming in right now, too. So uh, there's Katie Schultz asking, what is the next step towards identifying the origin of the Venusian phosphine? Venusian is, you know, from Venus. What is the next step to identifying it? So how much work needs to be done, for instance, before it becomes reasonable to send a probe to Venus? Because I think that that's kind of the direction that we need to go. And uh, William, you were telling me just recently that you were just discussing probes, right? For most of your day today. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, Sukrit and I were both on a, a long, uh, really exciting meeting talking about potential probes to go to Venus. But um, uh, yeah, you're right. Before we go to the expense and complication of doing that, there's lots of stuff we can do here on Earth. Um, we can get more measurements and uh, Clara is better suited to talk about that than me. Um, but there's also experiments we can do. You know, we don't really understand what's going on in the chemistry of these clouds around Venus all that well. Um, but we're fairly sure we know what goes into them. So we can put those things together in a lab, shine some light like sunlight on them and say, hey, what happens? Um, experiments like that sound really simple to do. You try messing around with concentrated sulfuric acid in the lab, you have to be a bit more careful than just mixing it up. Um, 
But yeah, there's a lot of Earth-based experimentation we can do to try to understand better what's going on in the atmosphere of Venus and in the clouds. Um, and then we'll be able to back that up with observations. I mean, Clara, do you want to talk about observations? Yes, I can talk about that a little. The, the incredible work that uh, the team did with JCMT and then later on with ALMA was all to detect one feature of phosphine. Granted, a very special feature of phosphine, really beautiful and isolated and strong. But I spent my PhD calculating these features of phosphine, and I calculated 16.8 billion of these features. And we made this incredible discovery just by detecting one of those 16.8 billion twice. <laughs> well, and that's incredible. That's really good. Um, but the next step, uh, as well as all that William just mentioned, is trying to detect any other of those 16.8 billion so that we are absolutely sure it is phosphine and so that we can map its distribution across Venus and in day-night variations and seasonal variations, all information that we can use to understand what is phosphine doing it and what or who is making it. That's really, really exciting. So I'm going to unpack that a little bit. Um, could you just describe to the whole audience what phosphine really is? Like, like what, what, what are we actually looking at here in Venus? What is phosphine? Uh, well, phosphine is a lovely molecule, looks a bit like this, a little pyramid uh, with a phosphorus atom on the top and three hydrogen atoms on the base of the pyramid. And it is a simple molecule that is really hard to make. Um, and that's why it's so hard to accidentally just find it somewhere and why it's so shocking that we found it on Venus. But it is also a very scary molecule and it's very toxic to most life that we would find pleasant. And it is usually associated with smelling terrible, though that's because of its neighboring molecules. Um, but it's certainly quite dangerous and life like ours avoids it mostly uh, except for the life that lives in the shadows on Earth that doesn't need oxygen and so can make phosphine rather happily. And that life that produces phosphine is kind of how we became inspired to consider phosphine as a biosignature. So phosphine is a really special little molecule. That's really exciting. Yeah. So it, it's something uh, that can be produced by microorganisms that don't live in places with oxygen and things like this. And it's probably not something that you'd mix into a cake at home. Like it's not as a common material that we have in our houses or anything like that. But it's, it's definitely a sign of either some weird uh, exotic chemistry and biochemistry going on or, or some sign of life. That's really interesting. And uh, Sakrit, I'd love to get you in on this next one. Uh, it says here, because you were just discussing probes as well, um, how do we know that the phosphine was not actually due to contamination from previous probes that we've sent to Venus? That's a really great question. That's a really great question. You can think about that in a few levels, the most critical of which is we actually haven't sent very many probes to Venus, and we have put, sent nowhere near enough mass to Venus to in any way explain any part of this signal. That's not a cause for concern, particular concern over here. A bigger concern is, it dials back to what Clara was talking about, what William were talking about, which is that we still, because phosphine is so toxic, we don't understand the kinetics of its, uh, of how it interacts a little bit, the quantum mechanical properties of how it interacts with other molecules. And that's the big, one of the big things that, as William was pointing out, you really need to, uh, to consider further. Wow, yeah, yeah, that's really, I mean, that's, uh, uh, what, I'm an astronomer and I'm a, I'm a simple man. When I hear words like quantum mechanical processes and things like this, I get a little bit scared of the math going on, but that's why I appreciate such, what, such a wonderful and brilliant panel in front of me here who really understands this kind of thing. And that's wonderful. And you know what? Uh, there are some third graders from Waikoloa Elementary right now who are also reaching out and they're really excited about this too, I think. And they are wondering if aliens are real out there and maybe just on Venus or maybe outside of that too. Do we think that aliens are real and could we possibly find a new species on Venus? I might throw that one to William. Wow. Um, well, if it is life on Venus, and we, we have to say every time we do not know that, um, uh, we do not know what's happening here. It's just really exciting not knowing. That's what being a scientist is about, finding something really cool that you want to find out about. Uh, but if it is life, um, it will definitely be a new sort of life. It's the, the environment on Venus is like nothing on Earth. It's, it's super acid. It's super dry. Although they're clouds, they're not clouds of water. And sulfuric acid will just suck the water out of anything it, and, and, and crush the molecules, never mind just the bugs. So it will be something 
completely unlike what we know on Earth. So yes, it would be a new species. Um, when people talk about aliens, they're usually talking about, you know, things that walk around and talk to you. Um, unlikely on Venus, I must say. Uh, where, when we speak about life, we're thinking about little microorganisms, um, a millionth of a meter across that sort of size, uh, living inside the droplets on the clouds. So uh, scientifically really exciting. Won't make great Hollywood movies though. So, so this type of alien is closer to the kind of black mold that you find in Hilo here in really damp places and stuff than it is to walking, talking intelligence, if there would be possibly life on this other planet. <laughs> but we're definitely talking mold, yeah. <laughs> More like mold or bacteria, but possibly uh, life in any case. And that's actually really exciting. So there's other questions coming in. There's one from Seiko Hayashi, uh, who says... Uh, is there a difference in the phosphine abundance, the amount of phosphine that we see at high and low altitudes in Venus, in the Venus atmosphere? So Emily, is there a particular place that this phosphine is coming from in Venus? So in our study, we've been able to determine that the phosphine's coming from around an altitude of 50 to 60 kilometers above the surface of the planet. So that's um, about so, 30 miles, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, so it's around that. And um, so, yeah, so that's where we can determine. It's coming from the cloud layer, about 50 kilometers or 30 miles above the surface. Yep. Wow, okay, because we know that Venus is a, is a pretty harsh place, as, as William was just talking about a little bit, right? I wonder, um, Sakrit, could you tell us a little bit about the conditions on the surface of Venus, why, why life might not be more abundant down there? It is not your ideal vacation spot, that's for sure. If you had to pick a place that, uh, Someone asked me the other day, could you send an astronaut to Venus? And I told them that OSHA would have real issues with that on a safety perspective. Um, <laughs> it's 400 plus degree, plus degree Celsius. It has 90 times our atmospheric pressure. So we have about one bar of atmospheric pressure. Venus has 90 times that. So on the surface, lead will melt. The, you put landers down there, the landers will melt. Uh, it destroys, if you put any kind of biochemistry that we know about it, it's gone in a, a hot second. So the surface is a very hostile environment. The clouds are better, even if marginally so. Wow, that's really, yeah, that's fantastic to know. For folks who don't know, the first probe that landed on the surface of Venus was in 1970. It was called Venera 7, and it lasted 23 minutes transmitting to Earth before it itself melted and, and, and couldn't really do anything from there. So high up in the clouds where the temperatures and the pressures are a lot nicer, where lead doesn't melt, I guess, is, is where this phosphine is coming from. That is very cool. Um, Jess, I'm going to pass this one to you here. This is a great, great question. And this is something that inspires me as an astronomer almost every day. So I really want to hit this one. It says, you know, how, uh, so this is Kulin Tarnas asking, how does the discovery of potential life, potential life on Venus relate to all of the things that are happening on our Earth right now, where we see uh, almost this destruction of life wherever we look? Can discoveries like this be leveraged to bring a greater care and appreciation for the life that we have here on Earth, connecting what we do in space to what we do on Earth. Jess, you want to take that one? Wow, what a, what a question. I mean, and I have to say, I mean, I have, you know, it's been a rough year. Don't know about you guys, but, you know, it's been a bit of a difficult one. And, and this week, you know, this week was a week to get, you know, it was worth getting out of bed, you know, for all of these wonderful authors here, I think it's something similar, right? To be able to present, you know, this kind of exciting, you know, concept and this amazing, you know, the, the serendipity of science is on display here, you know, just giving something a go and, and finding it completely unexpectedly. And, and how does this relate to us here? Well, I think nearly every person who finds out, you know, I'm an astronomer, either asks about black holes or says, are we alone in the universe? There's something about wanting to know if there's life off of our planet that is deeply inspiring, I think, to everybody here. And it's certainly something uh, which, you know, I never thought we'd even get cl this close to in our, you know, in our lifetime. So I think that we need a little hope right now. And, and the wonderful thing about something like astronomy, which may not seem to have immediate applications for us here on Earth and what we do, it actually does. Some of the technologies which have been developed for space travel, for telescopes, you know, they're now in your phone. Uh, they're now used in medical applications. And so all of these things which may not seem connected right now actually have uh, a lot of knock-on 
uh, support structures which go into our culture and into you know helping our communities. So I think it's an, a very inspiring just for us to know perhaps possibly we aren't not just alone in the universe. We might not be alone in our solar system. And like I said, we need a little bit of a pick me up right now. So I hope that that's something that it gives everybody. And we're just you know excited because we get to have this conversation about how now can we inspire perhaps a, another generation uh, of, of kids, especially who are going to ask be, you know better questions than ours. And, and where do we go from here? And the great thing is, I don't know, but I'm really excited. Can I just chip, can I chip, chip in on this something, Steve? I mean, this seems to be a completely you know, useless discovery. I mean, it's fascinating and it's, I'm, I'm just completely pumped by it, but you know, is it gonna cure coronavirus? Um, we don't know what the use of this will be. And I'll give you an example. So I printed this out earlier. This is a paper from um, 1969. And these guys went looking for a bug in a place where everybody says you couldn't have any bugs. Um, I said, no, there's, there's nothing there. You're wasting your time. And they found one. And this was in the hot springs in Yellowstone Park in the US. And um, at the time, that was just a, uh-huh, that's really interesting. So what? The enzymes from that bug are now the basis of the PCR reaction that's used in coronavirus tests. Wow. Look at that, right? So, this so who knows? Who knows what this is going to come to? And 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 this is this is the brilliant thing about uh, about discovery, uh, curiosity-driven science. You know, if it's done really well and thoroughly, like this fantastic team that I'm privileged to be working and have been doing, um, it'll find something, and who knows where that'll go to. Absolutely. This is one of the things that really drives me as a researcher too. You know, as Jess was mentioning, you have technology in the camera on your phone, in the GPS, even Wi-Fi has its roots back into astronomy when we were applying it to other things, right? Medical technology all over the place. And we can learn lessons from other places out there as well. There's been a lot of talk in the news recently about climate change and where we're heading as people. And actually, I think that I'm going to throw this one to Clara. Um, Clara, Venus has something to teach us about greenhouse gases, doesn't it? Uh, yes, I mean, this may be a little on the nose, but many people have pointed out that Venus used to be not quite so awful. It used to be pretty much habitable many millions of years ago. It had a, a reasonable surface where things could have lived. And it had a really nasty runaway greenhouse effect that rendered most of it uninhabitable. And now we're looking at an ever thinning habitable layer of the atmosphere. And so the Venusians, if they were there, this wasn't their fault. Uh, this was very much uh, a product of unfortunate location in the solar system and unfortunate composition. But in our case, we're the ones doing it. And so there's a lesson here of looking after planets that started off good. It's a really, really good point. You know, a lot of people say, you know, we need to look at the big picture. And in astronomy, I like to think that we look at the biggest picture, you know, and when we when we really look at where we are uh, in the universe, in our own solar system, we can learn lessons from these other places too. The more and more you zoom out from the Earth, the more and more we look closer together here on the planet and making it work together for each other's good. So astronomy really inspires me in that way. It's one of the reasons I'm an astronomer. That's wonderful. And actually on, on, on that point too, there's a, there's a question coming in from Paige uh, that says, curious to ask how such a large and diverse team coordinate their workflow over the years and planned what needed to be done and how they communicated with each other. <laughs> so Creed, I see you laughing here because this is probably a huge endeavor. Can you can you speak to this a little bit, Secret, uh, about how such a large and, and greatly diverse and wonderful team worked together to produce this? Yeah, um, to a degree, I think we really have to credit the scientific community in particular the vision at places like NASA with this. So this is a very large diverse team. One of the things that's special about it is that it draws expertise from a very wide range of disciplines biochemistry, regular chemistry, atmospheres, planets, instrumentation, astronomy, quantum spectroscopy, all this stuff. And these fields are so different from each other that for the most part, if you stick people from those disciplines in the same room, they can't understand each other. We can't uh, understand each other where it's like we're speaking different languages. Literally the same word can mean different things in different places like gravity waves versus gravitational waves, that kind of stuff. So all, so 
one of the special things that's happened is that um, institutions around the world, in particular, for example, here in the US, led by the NASA Astrobiology Institute, have put in a lot of energy and a lot of resources into teaching us to speak each other's languages, which I think many of us have benefited from to, so that we could learn to work together. And so I think that's been enormously helpful, plus an attitude of mutual respect and trying to learn from each other and trying to really tackle a shared problem together. I think, I think that's been very helpful. That's a wonderful thing. You know, when, when people from uh, different backgrounds, different nations, different regions all, are, are all around the world all agree on one thing, that science is cool and we should work together, right? You, you almost see all, all of these other differences sort of disappearing and, and people working together for, for the common good. That's really exciting to me. That's really exciting to me. Um, let me just see here. Uh, other things that, oh, so yes, yeah, so we've got so many questions coming in here. Um, let me just see. Would the panel? Oh, so so this is uh, an interesting one here. So, would there be any value from any of the plant? So the person specifically asks for planetary instruments at Keck. For those who don't know, Keck uh, is a telescope, two telescopes actually here in Hawaii. Would there be any value from any of these planetary instruments that could assist with this work? prior to sending a probe, but I'm going to open that up to the whole of Hawaii or other telescopes on Earth that we can look to right now since this is out there. Um, Emily, as an observer, do you know of any other telescopes around? You work at the, the telescope in, in London. I'm not sure if this one would be too much help for us, uh, but anywhere else around the world where, where you might set your sights to, to continue the research right now? So, I mean, I think the, the telescopes we have in London, you know, we have lots of light pollution in, in London. Um, so we might be able to capture a picture of, of Venus and, you know, a nice photograph of it, but I, I don't think we would be able to really do any research on Venus, unfortunately. Um, but yes, so one of the things that we're looking into, and Clara mentioned this earlier, actually, is we're going to try to um, search for phosphine gas um, in different kinds of light, so different wavelengths of light. Um, so we've been able to see phosphine kind of in microwave, like the microwave radio range, but we want to, to look at, at it in other kinds of light. So infrared, for example. So we're looking at infrared telescopes right now um, that could help us see phosphine um, in different wavelengths. And then that can give us a different picture as well of the, the phosphine gas that we're looking at and, and study kind of, um, you know, the amount of, of phosphine gas that we find in the atmosphere. That's a really, really great point that you bring up, right? Because uh, for those who don't know, there are many different types of light that astronomers look at. And certain telescopes have specialized, you know, um, instruments that observe each of these different types of light. And they tell us vastly different things about the universe. It's very much like if you're just, if you were doing some work on your car, if you were a mechanic, you can't fix everything if you only had a wrench, right? Sometimes you have to go get the hammer. Sometimes you have to go get another tool. And different telescopes exist as, as, as tools in our toolbox. So we can go out to all of these different places and really put together the whole picture of the universe when we start observing these different things. So infrared light looks like it's going to be a really promising next step, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. That's amazing. And uh, Jess, I think this next one is for you. As the instrument scientist here, as Jess builds instruments, um, if you... Let's just say you had an unlimited budget here, okay? <laughs> Wouldn't that be wonderful? If you, if you had an unlimited budget, what instruments would you want to put on a probe that you send to Venus? Oh, okay, this is a great question. And I'm gonna punt here too as well, but um, well, obviously we would want to go and actually measure you know, the composition of this gas. Uh, you'd like to do that in situ. And so you would want to make uh, you know, a, a little mass spectrometer, which is just a way of actually breaking down sort of the, the foot, the, 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 the you know, fingerprint, if you like, of, of the composition of those gases in there. And if you were going to go and do that, obviously you'd be looking for phosphine. We'd be looking for what are the compositions and how, you know, the temperatures it is, but also maybe we would be looking with this mass spectrometer to see if there actually are any kind of microbes like this in these sorts of, of cloud layers. So you have to figure out how to get an instrument down there that is not going to melt or break uh, in, in these extreme conditions and either figure out if it can do that, transmit information back to us, or perhaps really come back up in out of that dangerous layer to somewhere a little safer before it then decides to, to crunch all those numbers and send them back to us. That would be my first instrument, but trying to get the guy small enough 
right? So I'm already getting excited, but uh, yes, definitely that would be the first instrument that I would make. How about I throw the rest of the panel? How'd I do? Yeah. Anybody else have any burning ideas where they say, oh, I would put this here? Well, if I had infinite money, I would pay for a lot of PhD students and postdocs to work on that missing fundamental data on reactions and, and spectra and all the things that will be really, really useful when, if we find phosphine in a planet where we can't go and check. So that would be where I would put the, the billions of dollars. That's actually a really great point. John Castor here is actually asking a question. Are there, what, what specifically are the other chemical signatures that you would expect to see associated with phosphine as a result of life? Because as Clara rightly points out, Venus is our next door neighbor, but there's a lot of planets far away that we have to rely on the light where we can't send a probe. So what specific kind of things would, would you look for in situ with, with a phosphine molecule? Uh, Clara? Oh, I was going to throw that to William because oh, William. He, has, he has theories on that. Go, William. Um, uh, well, I mean, I, uh, so phosphine is a very reduced gas. So it's, it's this phosphorus, the three hydrogens attached, um, which is unusual for the gases in the atmosphere of Venus, which usually are things with oxygen atoms attached. So you want to look for other reduced gases like that. And the obvious two to look for um, that have got precedent on Earth will be methane and ammonia. Now, ammonia um, is a very basic gas. It, if you dissolve it in solution, it forms an alkaline solution. And so it's going to react with acids. And so it's going to react with all that sulfuric acid in the atmosphere. So it's not going to be as a gas in the atmosphere. So seeing that with spectroscopy is going to be difficult. Um, so I'd look for methane. But I gather, um, Clary, you can speak to this better than I. I gather methane's a bit tough. Yeah, methane um, has a spectroscopic signature, a molecular fingerprint, but is not as unique as phosphine. So it's, it's very hard to tell it apart from other molecules. Methane is carbon and hydrogens, which are lovely atoms, lovely atoms, but they're present in a lot of molecules. And so it's very hard to tell methane apart from other molecules. Phosphorus is a little more special, and that's how we can tell phosphine apart from other atmospheric constituents. Excellent. So you're talking about ammonia, and that's the same kind of ammonia that people use in like cleaning products and stuff here. Absolutely. Yeah. So, all right. So, so you got ammonia and phosphine, methane. We want to be. We've we've checked, right? There are no cows on Venus. Where we're pretty sure about that one. That can be. Do all we're of these? Pretty sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do, do all of these chemicals oh, smell we're bad? We're pretty sure, Clara. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. Uh, there are a it, lot of unknown unknowns, William. I'm just trying to keep an open mind. <laughs> Uh, cows in 850 degrees Fahrenheit uh, heat out there. Yeah. Wow. So all of these, all of these chemicals sound like things that we really wouldn't want to ingest or are really harsh to us or, or smell bad as well. Right. And so uh, are there, are there any specific places on the earth where we find an abundance of these things that we can study in more detail, like out in the field there? Uh, and I might pass that one back to William. Yeah. Um, there are a few. So as, as uh, Clara said, you know, phosphine tends to be made in these environments with no oxygen, um, which are pretty rare on the earth. Um, uh, they're also uh, this chemical concept of reducing environments. So they've got a lot of hydrogen in the molecules. Um, so you find them in, uh, in stagnant swamps and ponds. Um, sometimes the layer is averse and produce phosphine. Um, in sewage plants, sewage treatment plants, and landfill sites, um, and in poop. Um, particularly penguin poop. For some reason, Lovely. penguin poop produces a lot of phosphine, as well as being spectacularly smelly, I'm told. Um, not just penguin, I mean people as well. There have actually been studies measuring the phosphine in the gases coming out of people. Um, so, uh, so yeah, th there are environments. I, I wouldn't personally want to use the intestines of people as a model for Venus. I don't think that's going to be a very good model, but um, look, looking at, more seriously, looking at the metabolism of these organisms, seeing why they produce phosphate um, and how they produce it is, is another strand of the research we want to do in the future. And if I could just jump in there for just one moment, um, w there is a lot of, building off that, there's a lot of undiscovered countries. Like we know about the biological association of microbes with phosphine, but we still don't have the precise enzymatic characterization. And that's something we could have done uh, uh, if we have the technology for it. There just hasn't been a good reason for it. So one of the things we really hope people will do is take this as a call to go and look at some of those things that are a little bit more obscure, a little bit 
not as favored of the, of the community so far. We hope this will provide a reason to, to characterize these things so we can incorporate that into future thinking. Another example of how not knowing what you're doing with research at, at the time, you know, can, can provide a whole bunch of technological basis and understanding for things that we haven't even considered later. But wow, penguin poo. Yeah, that's, that's one that I've got to sit on for a little while. That's, I mean. I uh, want to thank you guys for that, because as someone who actually has smelled penguin poo, <laughs> and I, now, even though that was a decade ago, I haven't forgotten the smell at all and and something that cute shouldn't smell like that and and so now you know a decade later you guys have actually put a name to the horror that is a, a penguin rookery um which i certainly was not expecting at the time but we'll never forget so thank you very much for that guys and uh, hopefully our our biologists down there in antarctica um maybe we'll be be listening to this and now actually you know focusing perhaps on this uh, a little bit. I'm, I'm glad, hopefully, the memory of that scent will be useful for science now. I mean, right. it, it's truly the skills that you get through your life that you never know you're going to use on a panel about possible life on <laughs> Venus later in life. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. Oh, we have a couple of more uh, questions coming in. So this one I'm going to do first because it's uh, related to what we're talking about. And it's a great question. Paul Hickman says, if, if this stuff is in our human gut and is possibly toxic to humans, then why doesn't it harm us? William, I think that you're probably the best to answer that yeah. one. It's, it's, it's present in tiny, tiny amounts. I mean, in a parts per billion of, of, of the gas amounts, so it's far too little for you to, to do you any damage. But yeah, I, I mean, if you built up to the bad amounts, then that will be a problem. And, and, and there have been cases of uh, phosphine poisoning where people have eaten uh, chemicals that generate phosphine in their stomach and then you get high levels and then that's they're hospitalized with that that's very serious so yeah um uh by accident that could happen but yes the the natural generation in our gut seems to be fine wow so wow yeah that, that's that's truly something to think about for sure so yeah stuff that you definitely don't want to play around with definitely and, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, so we have a, a high school astronomy class, actually, that's tuning in as well. This is from Kumu Kassis, who is uh, who has their high school astronomy class here, and they've got a couple of questions. Emily, I think I'm going to toss this one to you. Does, does this detection suggest that early life, early life may have traveled between Venus and the Earth or to our neighborhood from a third location? Did it, did it come from somewhere else? I think that's a fantastic question. Good job. That is a really good question. And the short answer is we don't know. So we don't know if this is life, you know, that is in Venus's clouds. If it is life, we don't know how that life would have formed and how it would evolved or anything like that. Now, what we do know, as Clara mentioned before, is that Venus, you know, a long time ago, millions of years ago, was seemed to be a bit more habitable than what it is now. And it may have been kind of a more reasonable temperatures, um, less hostile, you know, for up to 2 billion years or a few billion years, really. Um, so it's possible then one of the theories behind possible life in the clouds of Venus is that there may have been life that, you know, evolved in independently on the surface. And then over time, as Venus started to heat up and get higher pressures, that life will have kind of migrated upwards into the clouds um, and then become some sort of microorganism aerial life. But at the end of the day, we just don't know if, you know, how that life would have developed um, if it is there. And do we know about any life high up in Earth or like any life that exists in the clouds of Earth or high up in our own atmosphere? Yeah, so there are microorganisms that kind of exist in, in the clouds of the earth. Um, and so there is aerial life that is seen uh, up in earth's clouds. Yep. That's interesting. So, so th this is such a, always a fascinating subject to me for uh, my wife is a biologist actually. So we have these discussions all the time and, you know, I think uh, evolutionary pressures driving these forms of life, possibly if they, if they are there from a more stable location, higher up over time for survivability, I think is really exciting. That's, that's a beautiful model. Anyway, we see how it works out. That's beautiful. And uh, so there's a couple of questions that were coming in on other platforms as well. Let me just see here. Uh, yeah, so this is a good one. Methane was brought up uh, with relation to Mars. So uh, Secrete, I'm gonna throw this one to you here. So, I mean, 
I'm old enough to remember when methane was discovered on Mars. And a lot of people got really, really excited. And they said, wow, there might be life on Mars. And, and people got really pumped about it. So how is this result different from that one? What's, what's special about phosphine on Venus in relation to some of these past studies? So that's a really great point, Steve. So the first thing that I'll point out is that you're not special here. I was also old enough to get super excited about methane on Mars, and I remain excited about the possibility of methane on Mars. Um, the differences are twofold. One is that uh, the strength of the, of the detection, it's still not 100% consensus that there is in fact methane present on Mars in the quantities quoted there. There's still a little back and forth in the community. And I'm sure Right now, at least, the detection of phosphine seems to be a little bit more secure, but we'll see what our scientific colleagues have to say about that as we do follow-up observations and so on and so forth. The other thing, and this is kind of a little bit what William was referring to, is that phosphine so far seems to be harder to make abiotically without biology compared to methane. Methane is something that it seems to be relatively, comparatively speaking, relatively easy for geology and chemical processes to make. Its free energy is a little bit more favorable but phosphine so far seems to be a little bit harder to make. I'll again throw in that cautionary note that we've all been pointing out here, which is that we've characterized methane and its reaction super well, but we haven't done that with phosphine. So if we go do, do those lab studies, maybe that opinion will, will change a little bit. TLDR, labs are great. We should do more of them. <laughs> I mean, uh, Clara, do you want to jump in with that at all? I mean, uh, unfortunately, you've only have one PhD so far, right? I mean, uh, you, you've done a pretty good job uh, classifying a, a lot about phosphine, but do, do you have anything to add? Yes, I think the search for biosignatures is one that, you know, we all discuss a lot and it is really exciting. And I think often people think of the the more obvious popular biosignatures, which tend to be the sort of gases we associate with life that, you know, smells nice. Uh, so oxygen and water, and these are wonderful biosignatures in many ways, and namely that they are likely to be present in large abundances. We have a lot of oxygen on earth and on earth, it's a really robust sign of life. Lovely, lovely life. Um, but oxygen and methane and water are lovely biosignatures that are produced by life because life likes making them partially because it's kind of easy to make it. And so there are lots of non-life processes that make them. And in the search for life in other planets, we end up having to balance this notion that you can find popular biosignatures that are abundant and easy to detect, but have a lot of false positives or you can detect uh, molecules that are rare and weird and hard to make. And because they're hard to make, are not gonna be there in large quantities, but they have low false positives. And playing this balance out, it's something we are trying to do responsibly. And I think we should be excited for all biosignatures, but it is okay to have favorites. And if you are, you know, indecisive about what you should have as your favorite biosignature, you know, think about this one. <laughs> if, uh, we don't discriminate here, but if you're in the market for biosignatures, phosphine is the way to go for sure. <laughs> that's that's so wonderful, and that's that actually leads uh, uh, that's a great transition into a couple of the other questions that we're getting in right now, because people are are, are specifically interested in this. You know, as as an astronomer, I have to say astronomy can be hard. You know, we're dealing with light coming from faraway places, and we don't have the same luxury as many, many other scientists who can just go dig ice cores or get soil samples. And so when things are very far away, we have to be creative of what we do. In Venus, Venus being right next door, it's an ideal location, a wonderful test, a wonderful laboratory place where we can get great, great signals from. So we have to start thinking about these things for other places out there in the solar system or other places in our galaxy too, outside of our own solar system. So there's a couple of questions here, and I think that they're related. So I'm going to try to string them together. There's one from Mingtang Chen, who says, presumably, the amount of microbes in Venus is much more than all the microbes in humans and penguins' intestines combined so that we can detect it with our telescope. So um, I wonder if, uh, Emily, do you know the abundances off the top of your head of uh, penguin phosphine? <laughs> I do not, but I imagine that William will. Um, well, so that's sort of two, uh, uh, so unpack that under two parts. Um, the amount of phosphine in our atmosphere is incredibly small. It's sort of low parts per trillion. Um, but that's partly because it's broken down much more efficiently in our atmosphere down the, at, at ground level because we've got a, a, a lot, an oxygen rich atmosphere. And UV light splits the oxygen and water into very reactive species. And those tube the phosphine up very fast. 
So in Venus, the kinetics of that happening are somewhat different, and so it's broken down somewhat more slowly at this level at which um, uh, Jane Greaves and Emily and the others have detected it. Um, uh, but yeah, to explain the phosphine there, we have to assume that the, the microbes are quite widely spread across the planet and not just in tiny little colonies of penguins. Um, uh, but, but, but it doesn't have to be huge amounts. Um, you know, we don't have to have a meter thick layer of penguin poop all over the planet in order to explain what's going on here. It just has Thankfully. to be a thin sphere. <laughs> but, but I'm, I'm sorry, Jess, we keep on coming back to penguin poop and I know this is, this is giving you flashbacks, but um, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, disclaimer it's... disclaimer we have not found penguins and penguin poop in the atmosphere of venus no no absolutely <laughs> uh we haven't, we haven't definitive definitely found life we we might have found life but if it is there the density of bacteria is going to be um probably thinner than it would be in 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 a sort of thin layer of penguin poop yeah, I, and I mean, it, it's a thing that's really impressive about the telescopes that we have here, too. And I mean, in Hawaii and in Chile, we have the most amazing technology to detect this kind of thing. So these cameras are very, very sensitive. And, and it surprises people to know that we can measure things with the accuracy and the precision that we can. I mean, there, we can measure certain motions far away out in space, you know, and velocities of a few feet per second. Uh, wherever we're looking. And so we actually have these really, really sensitive, sensitive uh, cameras that, that can detect even small signals over in Venus. And um, the other question that was related to that is how long phosphine lasts in the atmosphere of Venus? Does it, does it break down? Like, are we looking at something from a long time ago or are we looking at something from, from right now? And uh, I guess it's either William or Clara on that one. William, do you... Yeah, so that's a really great point. The essential thing to realize is that um, everyone agrees that in the upper part of Venus's atmosphere, where you have lots of UV, the lifetime of phosphine is incredibly short. We're talking seconds. On the other hand, in the deep interior of Venus's atmosphere, down at the bottom where there's no UV, not at the very bottom where it's hot enough that phosphine decays on its own, but kind of in that lower middle regime, the lifetime of a phosphine molecule, if you could just hold it there and prevent it from moving, could be very, very long, hundreds or thousands of years, maybe even longer. But the thing is, that's not how atmospheres work. There's always some degree of turbulent uh, of motion in the atmosphere. And molecules can't just stay in one place, they'll have to move. And even though molecules in the bottom of Venus's atmospheres move very slowly, they do move at some rate. And that rate will eventually end up transporting those molecules to the upper part of Venus's atmosphere where they'll be efficiently destroyed. So we state that based on the calculations that we've done, the lifetime of uh, phosphine in Venus's atmosphere overall has to be less than a thousand years old. Anything less than that, and it's gonna be taken up to the top of the atmosphere and destroyed. And that rules out a lot of things that, for example, William modeled really carefully, like the delivery of, a gig of the impact of a gigantic comet uh, several uh, uh, within the last thousand years that could have delivered a lot of the uh, reduced oh, material. Wow. wow. Yeah, yeah, that, that's amazing. So <laughs> this is something that you'll get used to if you keep on tuning into these live panels when astronomers are talking, you know, like we'll talk in thousands of years, millions of years, and we'll say, oh yeah, it's, you know, it's got to be sometime in the last thousand years. If you're thinking that's a long time, you know, to an astronomer, we deal with a lot bigger numbers usually. So <laughs> last thousand years. Yeah. So, you know, so it's just that this isn't some ancient thing and phosphine isn't destroyed in seconds, except up where that UV radiation from the sun is really destroying it in the top atmosphere. So, so how, how, how big is Venus's atmosphere anyway? You said it's about 50 kilometers up that we're finding phosphine, right, uh, Emily? Uh, but uh, how big is that with relation to, to the rest of Venus? That's Kevin Kay asking. Oh, I, I don't know, actually, the, the full thickness of Venus's atmosphere. That's so, a good question. It, it's, yeah. it's, it's like, yeah, atmospheres don't come in boxes, right? It just kind of wisps this way, right? So, I mean, on, on the Earth, we even have atmosphere upwards of 200 kilometers above us, right? Yes. And Venus has more atmosphere kind of digging out a little bit for two reasons. One, it's a lot hotter. So what we call the scale height is a lot larger. It's a lot puffier. Ah. So that's part one. Part two is that it has more atmosphere overall. So if you combine the two of those together, Venus's atmosphere extends up much, much further than Earth's atmosphere does. It's much more extended. So for example, in our modeling, we had to model Earth's, uh, the Venusian atmosphere at significantly larger distances than we do for, uh, for example, the Earth's atmosphere. 
Yeah, thanks for that. Okay. So, you know, we're getting pretty close to the hour. So I think that I can do one more question that's in here and then we can do wrap up statements as well. So this last question that came in, and I think it's great uh, to, to, sim to show how special this Venus result is. Somebody's asking about um, phosphine on Titan or the gas giants because they found that there's also phosphine gas found in Saturn and Jupiter uh, when you go looking for it. So that doesn't necessarily indicate that there's life out there though, right? Uh, Clara, do you want to answer how Venus is different from these gas giant planets that we have? Yes. So on Jupiter and Saturn, we do find phosphine and it's still weird there. We find it in the observable layers of these planets where it should be far too cool and, and the pressure that the hydrogen is under should be far too low for phosphine to be made. But when I say it's weird, I don't mean like Venus weird. I mean weird, but we can explain it. So we know how phosphine is uh, observed on, um, on Saturn and Jupiter, and that's because deep down in the atmospheres of these planets, you get these really intense environments where it is really hot and the hydrogens are in, under so much pressure that phosphine can be made accidentally, no need for life. So I can guarantee no life on Jupiter and Saturn. I can go on the record saying that. And so we can explain it on Jupiter and Saturn. And this means phosphine can be present in other um, gas giants or hot Jupiters or brown dwarfs, places that have access to environments that are this intense. And there phosphine does not need to be a sign of life. In fact, it very much is not a sign of life. But on terrestrial planets like Earth and Venus and other potentially habitable exoplanets, we don't have any regions that are anywhere as intense as we find on the depths of these gas giants. And in those places, we cannot explain any detectable amounts of phosphine yet. And so that's where we're at. Wow, yes, that's fantastic. And I think that's a great overview of the scientific process moving forward, right? Here's something that we can explain and something that we have difficulty to explain and where there's room to grow and where we, we keep on pressing forward. And so for to that third grade Waikoloa class tuning in to the high school astronomy class, we're looking forward to your PhDs because we're gonna be reading those and learning a lot more by the time that you get there too, right? So this, this has been a wonderful, wonderful discussion and thank you so much. And I'd just like to, to close up with a couple of inspiring things, you know, so there's, there's all this exciting news and we certainly weren't able to touch on all of it for sure. I, I'd be certainly remiss though if we didn't mention a couple of these things, but um, so far beyond, you know, the scientific feats and the science and everything like that and, and, and the actual technical work of this, I'd just like to go around and very briefly, very, very briefly, how did this detection personally impact you when you when you realized that there really was a detection of Venus or a detection of phosphine on the on Venus in the atmosphere of Venus when you realized that there was a detection of phosphine how did you feel what did it make you feel can we start with uh, William perhaps oh um well I don't think I should say in broadcast um I was <laughs> it was I, I was just gobsmacked, as, as the British say. Um, yeah, I, I just thought that's astonishing because I knew a little bit about the chemistry of Venus, not nearly as much as I know now, um, but enough to know that was just astonishing. And of course, we've been working on phosphine and the biosignature. I just put those two together and thought, wow, we, I have to do more of this. That's wonderful. Emily, how about you? How do you feel? Um, so I think I was just shocked to be completely honest. Um, when, when we first put the proposal together uh, to ask the JCMT for time to, to study phosphine in Venus, we didn't think we were going to find anything. And I know that seems strange, but not finding a gas can still be really beneficial and you could still kind of say something about the atmosphere and things um, and the possibility for life. But when we found it, it was just such a big surprise. And it was just really amazing. It was very overwhelming. Yeah. Overwhelming, shocked, gobsmacked. Uh, Sukri, what's your story? My story is just, I was, I was also very shocked, but I was also very happy in the sense that uh, we were all preparing for the search for life on exoplanets because of course, who would, have, who would think to look for life on Venus? And the instruments to do that haven't been built yet and probably won't be built for a decade or so. And so to, now we get to execute that same intellectual machinery that we were planning to use for look for life at exoplanets, but we can do it right here in the solar system. So I'm excited because I don't have to wait a decade or two for my career to really get started. Now we can start thinking about these things right here, right now. 
and test that intellectual machinery before we built those instruments to look for life on planets other stars. So I, it's really exciting to me because what was uh, far in the future is now today. That's so wonderful. High school students tuning in 10 years from now. I mean, that's the time, right? If you want to get in on this, uh, certainly you can always reach out to the Mauna Kea observatories and us too. And Clara, your story. Um, I, I was also shocked, but I was mostly just really proud of my little molecule that, you know, <laughs> it seemed so horrible initially when I first started working on it. And now it just did you know, such good work. Um, and so, yes, I mostly feel uh, and, and felt really, really excited that phosphine wasn't just a hypothetical biosignature. It could just be something that could signify life next door. And then of course I started thinking, wow, if there's life next door on Venus um, and on earth, which looks nothing like Venus, then there's life everywhere. Uh, and the, Galaxies must be covered with habitable planets with trillions of life forms releasing thousands of molecules into their atmosphere. And now we just need to develop the toolkit to detect these, you know, messages of life from all over the galaxy. And the only thing we'll be missing then is um, people to join the force. So all of those students listening in, if you want to get into quantum astrochemistry, drop me an email. <laughs> That sounds like loads of fun, actually. Who'd think a single pixel sitting in Hawaii just opened infinite possibilities to, towards our future here, too? And, and Jess, of course, the news has been huge in Hawaii. So many people are talking about it. There's even, I heard, a new word in Olelo Hawaii, which was invented for this. And Jess, could you talk about that and your reaction when you discovered or when you realized the discovery? Well, Jane first, she sent me um, a, a draft of the paper with the spectrum without any warning. Like, so that she, they'd taken the, you know, Emily and Jane had taken the data like two years before. So it had fallen out of my very leaky brain. So she, it, I had no warning that the spectrum just came up on the screen and I must have sat there for half an hour staring at it. And when I got the power of speech back, I, I just called up Jane at some awful hour in the UK and said, Jane, you, I don't, you, you can't just send me this without any warning. I can't breathe. And then, of course, because this is not my field, I Googled phosphine. Because, um, yeah, that was, I had a lot, a lot of homework after that to really get my head around it. But we are very lucky here in Hawaii um, to have, uh, we have had the efforts of uh, Professor Larry Kimura, uh, who they do call the grandfather of the revitalization of the Hawaiian language movement here in Hawaii, who also, um, bestowed a name on black hole image, uh, which we discovered two years ago, Poveki. And this time around, he has, uh, he translated our press release into fully into Aleo Hawaii. And that often means because we're coming up with things that maybe haven't been said in Hawaiian before, that he has to make up uh, a, new, a new word for them. And, and in this case, he's done that. And the word is maka ola. Now maka, is it can mean eyes, so it means to be looking at. In fact, our instrument, our new instrument, which we're also looking at Venus with, is, is Namakanui, which means big eyed fish. Uh, they see, they come out and hunt in the darkness, which is why they, that's perfect. And, and so Makaola actually means a possible detection of life. And, and so this is, uh, we're again just incredibly privileged to be able to, um, to have this new word. And, and hopefully this is a word we may use often uh, in the coming years and decades as we start to search for these exciting biosignatures on other planets. And maybe this will be what we're doing, going and hunting Makaola for a detection of life. That's so wonderful. That is so, so wonderful. That is, that is such an inspiring way to think about this in the future. There are things we can still do on Earth, as we talked about. There are probes that we want to send to Venus in the future. This has been really, really inspiring. Once again, congratulations to all of you on this whole panel for this exciting work. And I know I'm speaking on behalf of so many here when I wish you all the success in the future of this. We want to hear more and more about how this goes on. So thank you so much to all of our panelists for taking the time to be here today. Thank you for doing that. And mahalo nui, everybody who is tuning in online. Uh, you can follow us on social media for more great science content, for more panels like this. The links are all in the description there. But uh, thank you very much to everybody. Mahalo nui. And until next time, ahui ho. <laughs>